Hey everyone! Recently I made a video about my 10 favorite reads from last year and talking about all the reasons why they were my favorite books uh, from 2019 and today I want to make a fun, uh, a sort of fun video or you could say it's an act of masochism uh, because I want to read out one star Goodreads reviews of those 10 books and then give my responses to, to those reviews. Uh, so uh, this this could be sort of like a test of um, me keeping my cool because obviously uh, all these books meant quite a lot to me, um, were uh, personal favorites of mine, and to hear people slag them off is going to be quite challenging um, to, to, uh, to stay reasonable about that because obviously I think everyone has their own opinions about books, um, have their own feelings about them, and uh, uh, that's one of the great things about reading, that, that uh, we all have different responses to books, but at the same time, uh, books that I dearly loved so much to have them completely written off is uh, is uh, is going to be quite a, a challenge. So I'm uh, I've got Goodreads up, and I have uh, ten reviews that I've picked out, one star reviews that I'm going to read out. So uh, starting off with Dex Newburyport by Lucy Elman, and I'm not surprised that this book wasn't everyone's cup of tea because of you know the the big length of it and uh, and the style of writing. I, I just knew it wasn't going to be everyone's style, but personally I loved this book. Uh, so uh, the first one star review I'm going to read out. Um, so it had 86 one star reviews on Goodreads, and uh, and one goes. The fact that the one-star reviews on Goodreads were the best part of reading this book, the fact that Lucy Elman is related to Richard Elman, famous Joyce biographer, ripped Joyce off, hashtag Joyce did it first, the fact that I can never get those hours of my life back for reading a prize-winning novel because of nepotism, the fact that Joyce is a way better writer of stream of consciousness, the fact that any comparison of the two authors is not tolerable. Ew. Just ew. This book made want to use it as a paperweight and then no, just no. S M D H. Uh, that does that mean shaking my damn head? Is that that? I think that's what that means. Uh, so yeah, okay. Um, I, I think it's quite unfair that people keep comparing this this novel to James Joyce. I mean, there it's obvious to make that comparison. And yes, her father is a biographer of James Joyce, and um, so so people will naturally be doing that. Um, but it's it's her own novel, and Lucy Elman has said in interviews before that she hasn't read Ulysses for many many years, and she doesn't think it had that big an impact on her. So to just hold this up and say, is this as good as Ulysses? Hmm, um, is is a bit unfair to, to keep doing uh, but uh, yeah and um, and I think it's funny that she um, sort of imitates that style of, of uh, the the phrase the fact that which is continuously used throughout this novel because it goes to show how influential it is I mean you can't help reading this novel and want not want to imitate that style and want to say the fact that this or the fact that that. Um, it, I think it just goes to show how much it sort of seeps into your consciousness. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, when the, when she says, ew, just ew, that, that reminds me of that TV show Schitt's Creek and, and Alexis, um, the, the daughter of this rich family who always goes, ew, David, ew. <laughs> so I think maybe uh, she's been watching too much of that, that show. But uh, yeah, so okay, that is the, the first review. Um, then next off, we are going to go to Girl, Woman, Other by Bernardine Evaristo. And there are 63 one-star reviews of this novel. Uh, so one goes, Rarely am I so disappointed by a novel. This book reads like a sociologist writing a novel. The characters have zero depth. So many cliches. Each woman so obviously representing a political point. I wanted to like this book, but I can't. <laughs> okay, um, so I mean, the the characters actually have quite a lot of depth and go quite through a lot of changes in in this novel. And the the thing about 
each character representing a different political point. I mean, yeah, the, you can see that all these characters represent very different kinds of a black British woman, um, black queer woman, um, and, and represents a whole range of experiences. But what I think makes this book so interesting is you see their perspectives on each other and uh, and how they have very different opinions of each other from how you know they see themselves from the inside and so it, it it gives a whole range of perspectives in a really interesting way in my opinion uh so yeah i find it interesting i mean maybe maybe this was a case of their expectations were too high which can certainly be the case with some prize-winning novels that you think it's going to be the greatest book ever and if your expectations are like whoa then uh you're just the actual experience of the the text or or whatever isn't going to meet those expectations so um yeah, so, so that's, that's that review. Uh, next, uh, we're going to go to uh, my favorite, Joyce Carol Oates, uh, and her most recent novel, My Life as a Rat. And there are 44 one-star reviews of this on Goodreads currently. And uh, this is a very short one-star review that just goes, well-written, but nasty and gritty not my cup of tea. <laughs> That's all. So, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, this just makes me think of, of the, the sort of nasty comment of the, the highly, like, political statement made recently, which I think Trump first made about, about nasty women. And, um, and so to call a book written by a woman nasty, I think is, is you can't help but think of that, that, uh, that phrase, which has been bandied about a lot. And, uh, and obviously that's like a ridiculous thing to say. I mean, she's dealing with, uh, real life difficult issues in our society and, and, uh, yeah, those are going to be gritty and hard to deal with. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's just the way it goes. And so, I mean, I guess this reader just wants a light, fluffy read and, uh, and this isn't going to be the book for that, obviously. So, uh, going next on to, uh, The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead, uh, which has 322 one-star reviews. And I think, um, because this has been a novel which has been talked about quite a lot and had a lot of big recommendations, as this, uh, as this reviewer says, uh, so, um, so that's what led to so many one-star reviews, but it has many, many more five-star reviews. But anyway, uh, one of them goes, Dear me, what a poor writer. Subject is not literature. It requires form, prose style, and reason. This had none of those. Mind you, it does have Obama's endorsement. Avoid. <laughs> Just avoid. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's such a big generalization statement. Uh, it's not really saying anything. It's just sort of attacking the thing as as a whole um i mean i think he does have a very good prose style and it's very um readable as well as really beautifully written and um and writing about really interesting subject matter so um to say it has none of those is uh, is uh, is going a bit far i think <laughs> so next i have damien barr's novel you will be safe here and this has four one-star reviews, only four one-star reviews, so not that bad. Um, and this review goes, Unfortunately, I couldn't get into this habit, only read 5%. I thought it would pick up, but no. I was really looking forward to reading a book set in South Africa. Mm, that's it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's uh, uh, strange that they are so disengaged by it because this novel begins in a really gripping way of a woman being forced off from her farm. Um, her for farm is basically burnt to the ground and she's forced into a concentration camp with her son, um, which is really like gripping, um, terrifying subject matters to, to day, say that they weren't engaged. And then, well, it shows the, the mother while she's in this camp and trying, struggling to keep herself and her, her child alive, um, yeah, to be 
disengaged by it and to talk about a part of South African history that's not often talked about all that much. Um, you think they would be interested in this as a South African novel, but uh, but no, I guess it just didn't work for them. Uh, so next I have Constellations by Sinead Gleason. Um, this is a book of autobiographical essays and this has seven one-star reviews. And this one goes, atrocious. I wanted to like this, but it's just too shallow and reads like the script of a bad daytime TV soap opera. Don't believe the hype. This is bottom of the barrel stuff. Okay, well, that's, that's, uh, that's quite damning. Uh, yeah, I mean, to say reads like a TV daytime soap, um, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, she's writing about her own life. It's not like she's, um, she's like made these things up to, to be overly dramatic. It's, uh, it's her experience. And, um, and she, to say it's shallow, I mean, that's completely ridiculous because she goes into to the subject matter of her life in a lot of depth and makes a lot of poignant comparisons to different art pieces and um, and different historical incidents and and frames the this particular incident of time in Ireland and and uh, yeah uh, uh, I don't know if I can keep doing this but um, I'm gonna press ahead and go next to Annie Erno's novel The Years another book which is sort of autobiographically inspired and um, but is was published. Um, uh, as a novel in France and in the UK, it was published as an autobiography, but it was um, it was shortlisted for the the Man Booker International Prize. And yeah, anyway, it, this has 22 one star reviews, um, and so this is this is a bit longer review. Um, it says, I DNF'd this book because although this was said to be translated, yet it still has a language barrier that I couldn't understand. To keep looking it up every few minutes was getting frustrating. I also did not like the way that this autobiography was written in individual sentence form or in very short paragraph form. It was confusing. Sexual desire was compared to memories in the same breath as talking about grandparents and parents. Bizarre. Things didn't seem to mesh well together or tie in well most of the time. Some things that the author stated I didn't even understand, such as, to exist is to drink oneself without thirst. Huh? Again, not sure if it a language barrier thing or the way it was written, but I only made it a couple chapters before giving up. This is very rare for me. As you can see, this is only my second DNF out of almost 400. I did give this book to a friend, though. Here's hoping that she enjoys the, it more. <laughs> so, I, I mean, a lot of these reviews are like so poorly written themselves, and um, so that this reviewer is is criticizing the English translation of this, um, but can seem to very barely form sentences in English um, themselves is is, uh, is I think saying something in itself. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess with translated books, there are going to be um, sort of phrases which don't sort of are, aren't quite as common in, in English and um, and I can't remember I mean there probably are still some French words that are, are used in this because uh, the translator just didn't feel like they, they could be translated in a poignant way or feels like they'll be known enough in English that they'll understand them and um, and yeah I mean it's it's a very different style of writing but one that I thought was completely revolutionary and and really exciting and interesting different way of looking at a person's past but also a whole past of a community and a, and a certain culture and uh, and so it's a shame they didn't find it uh, effective but uh, but yeah and um, and and it, and it uses quite a lot of yeah these sort of poetic um, phrases so to say to exist is to drink oneself without thirst but I think that's quite an interesting way of looking at existence how we just sort of have to spend all this energy all the time um, whether you know so sort of we want to or not um, because that's that's just part of existence um, that, that you have to go on and you have to spend your Yourself constantly um, living your life, uh, whereas you know most of the time we'd we'd just like to lay back and have a good rest and a good sleep. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so um, so I, I know I think maybe if you think a bit more about some of these phrases, maybe they'll be uh, have a bit more impact for you. Um, but but yeah, it's it's I mean perfectly fine to 
to say if if they don't work for you and and uh, but uh, but but yeah I I disagree <laughs> so um, so next going on to this brutal house by Niven Govindan um, this has four one star reviews and this review goes this was not for me I did not engage with the narrator as it was all phrased as we but I could not get enough of a grip on who we were to particularly care. The prose was too dense and did not seem to be going anywhere. Sorry, but I could not read this. Like, well, <laughs> I'm sure you probably actually could physically read this, but uh, but you just didn't want to or didn't want to continue engaging with it, um, which is fine. I mean, I think it's important to, you know, move on from books if they're not doing anything for you. And, um, and yeah, it does use a really unique style of narration. At the beginning of the book, at least, it's narrated in this collective we voice of a group of mothers from drag houses um, who are engaged in a protest together and but I think it's so interesting showing how they have this sort of collective point of view and uh, but then it goes into the the point of view of one of the children of these drag houses and you get um, that that man young man's perspective as well as other um, through him other children from the drag houses and so you see how the the there's sort of opposition between these these different voices and uh, and yeah I mean uh, you can I mean it's difficult to get into the characters because you see them as a collective in the beginning but uh, but I don't know I thought it just was such an interesting way to go about writing about these these characters that I I found it really engaging and good so but that's you know that's just my opinion <laughs> so uh, okay next going on to Paul takes the form of a mortal girl by Andrea Lawler uh, and this has 28 one star reviews and this, this review goes, What did I just read? I felt the book was divided into two parts. The first I thought was a parable of being transgender. Interesting. A fun read. And then, in part two, it completely reverts to a look at, at those LGBT times of the 80s and 90s in New York and San Francisco, recognized much of the references, the shapeshifter context is cooled. In the end, I just felt that I didn't get it, didn't know what I was supposed to get, a waste of my time. And um, I don't know what they mean, especially by uh, the shapeshifter context is cooled. Um, did they mean that the, the sort of the, the aspect of this character who can change back and forth between male and female took a secondary aspect to the, the plot of the story or I, I think that's what they they meant, but um, but but actually, um, the, it it takes a big part in the the second part of this novel because um, the the central character of Paul meets another character who's able to switch back and forth between genders and alter their physical appearance in a in a very radical way. Uh, so yeah, I'm not really sure what they they mean by that, and yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, it, they obviously read the entire novel, which uh, a lot of the people who wrote um, these reviews didn't didn't read the entire book and so you know I feel like you can't always fully I mean you're obviously can still have an opinion of book um, if you haven't read the entire thing and you know that's perfectly valid as long as you say that you haven't read the whole book but um, but but sometimes you need to read to the end of the book before um, being able to really see the what the, the book was about. I mean, there's sometimes I've finished reading the book and it's only then that it's all come together for me. But anyway, obviously this wasn't what this person um, did reading this book. Um, but um, but yeah, it just, um, I think they, they just didn't get the, the sort of the humor and the style of it because I found this a very funny book and um, and maybe they were just really turned off by the, the character of Paul who's um, who is quite a difficult character. And um, But I found the character of Paul very endearing so um so yeah I don't know it just it all worked for me but uh, obviously didn't for them and then finally um the last book is uh, Underland by Robert McFarland a book of nonfiction about him traveling to different subterranean zones in the world and uh, and this has 43 one star reviews and this review goes I was only able to force myself to read one third of this book Parts are disconnected, 
parts are utterly, utterly uninteresting. The author does not. <laughs> oh, the author does have an impressive vocabulary. So, <laughs> it, it, uh, yeah, Robert McFarlane knows a lot of words. So yeah, he has a uh, he has that going for him. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, it. I mean, he he talks about lots of different places and um, and and lots of different uses of these subterranean zones. Like some people just sort of go caving as recreational sport. Other people are using these under land places as scientific laboratories. Um, other people are using them as places to dispose of, of waste that, um, that wants to be got rid of. So it's just sort of a broad overview of all these spaces, spaces and, and all of the different uses for them. But yeah, they, they only read one third of the book. So I think maybe if they'd kept on, it would have come together more for them um, and would have seen less random um, as he was making a more overarching statement about our environment and our relationship with the environment, like our real physical relationship with the, the landscape around us. Um, so, uh, but, but yeah, they, yeah, and he does have a very good vocabulary. He, he uses lots of, of, of interesting words that aren't used a lot. And, uh, and you'll see by his Twitter account, he often will, uh, will cite a, a word that's sort of been forgotten, but which has a very beautiful sound to it and, uh, and has an interesting meaning. So, um, yeah, uh, well, there you go. There you have it. Those are the um, the ten one star reviews that I was going to read. Uh, but yeah, obviously I have a very different opinion. Um, so if you want to know my opinions, I'll put a link below to uh, to my video talking about all these ten books, my thoughts on them, um, but also my individual reviews of each of these books. And uh, and yeah, I, I I found that quite emotionally distressful um, to reading reading all of those because. Uh, yeah, it's it's a bit upsetting to to hear people just so blatantly dismiss books that that I really loved. But uh, but yeah, um, let me know if you ever go and read one star reviews of uh, of some of your favorite books and and let it rile you up as as much as it did me. Um, and uh, but but yeah, this was just a, a fun thing. So um, so uh, hope you're doing well, and uh, I'll speak to you again soon. Bye everyone.